So what if the values you're living aren't your own? Well, what a question. I mean, like, what, what, if, what if we've been, like, living somebody else's values? Reminds me of Woody Allen's comment. He said he thought he was dying, and he saw his life flash in front of his eyes. He realized it was someone else's life. <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, that's kind of perfect, actually. <laughs> well, this is Thriving in Business and Life. I'm Christopher Harding. And I'm Will Wilkinson. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Boy, that's, a, that's pretty deep, actually, when you think about it, isn't it? It is. <laughs> I mean, have I been living someone else's life, yeah. right? Uh, in a blog we recently did, uh, you recall the story that I had shared once before about a young guy who was in the process of becoming a country singer, only to realize that that was his dad's dream, not his own. Well, I thought that was such a great story. I mean, for that reason right there, he realized he was living someone else's life, his dad's life. But also because what he chose to do was because it become a house painter. Right. And, you know, you compare, like, okay, and I don't mean, like... Uh, an artistic painter, a house painter, it would be easy to compare those two and say, okay, country and western singer, star versus house painter. Right. What, what a right. drop. But he was happy as a clam, as you said. Well, yeah, because that was what led him up. And I think this is the one thing that we've come across when we start to think about and work with people on identifying what are their values is the question we're asking really behind that is what lights you up? What are you passionate about? What, what brings you to life and, and has you just in your best, you know, being your best self? Well, it's sad that a lot of people get to the end of their life and will realize that they missed out on yeah. having their values. I remember being with my mother in the last few days of her life. She's had so many regrets. Mm. And the, the regrets were really exactly what we're talking about. She'd been living a life that she thought she should live. And should is the operative word here. Right. Duty. You know, yeah. It's a duty. And I can remember her saying, why did I work so hard? Why didn't I just sit and have tea with the girls more often? You know, her, her daughters-in-law. She was filled with regret for not living the life she really wanted to have lived. Well, you know, that's, I think, can happen so easily. Uh, you know, a lot of times values are pers prescribed to us by parents or others. And, you know, with, with the best of intentions, I think. Uh, and, and usually we take those on at such an early age that it might take something dramatic before we start to say, is this who I really want to be? Well, and also we get conflicting messages from the media, and so much of our education now comes from media, right. one kind or another. On the one hand, you've got values, you know, capital V, <laughs> like right. honesty, integrity, so forth, and then you've got the heroic character who usually flaunts all the rules. Yeah, so yeah. So what do you make of that? I mean, here are these values, you know, which are true and right, and then the hero who is the rebel. And it goes against all those values, right? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 kind of interesting. We've got a friend, and we've interviewed him on the program before, Gary Dixon, who's the president of the Foundation for a Better Life. And their whole campaign, billboards and other campaigns, TV commercials, are encouraging people to adopt, you know, values that are meaningful. And the real key there is, is they're not asking you to adopt values that they suggest. Mm -hmm. They're they're putting values out there to have people consider, is that something that's meaningful to me? Because if it is, then the most important way to do that is actually live it out. Well, you know, I think we've got to go here where I'm intending to go right now, <laughs> a little preamble, which is that we live in a society where there definitely are people who think they know better than others. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's justifiable for parents who are raising children, and children don't know to not put their hand on a hot stove, or they'd eat candy all day, etc. But at least supposedly when we grow up, we've individuated and matured to the point where we can make our choices intelligently. But we've got a lot of people in positions of power who are imposing their values on other people and feeling that society will be a whole lot better when those other people are living my values. <laughs> right. If I, if the world would just conform to, to my, my version. Yeah. My wife and I call that the world according to us. Yeah. Right. If, if everybody would just do things the way we preferred they would, we'd be more at peace. Well, right? and, and, and here's a question. This just really bamboozles me. I have to be honest. In politics, how individuals who have been dead wrong 
over and over and over again continue being respected for their new advice. <laughs> Why well, is that? You know, if their values are obviously in conflict with the way things go, you know, they're imposing what they think is going to happen or should happen based on the values that are important to them. It doesn't go that way. They're wrong. And yet, there they are again on the on news, making their next predictions, and people are going, oh, well, he said that. Why would we pay any attention to them? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I bring that back home and say, <laughs> how many how many times have I, you know, espoused a certain value and tried to live it out and had, and, and you know, failed at it, you know, totally, and yet repeated the same thing over and over again, Well, but I'm, right? I'm assuming, because I know you pretty well, that you've got some humility around that and that you would be inclined to say you know i was off on that and i learned a few things and here's my new take i don't see these guys doing that <laughs> well you know <laughs> it's the world we live in <laughs> i mean i followed the nba uh, just the playoffs right right and so there's charles charles barkley on one of the tv shows and he's predicting portland all the way Right. There's no chance Golden State can win because, you know, Kevin Durant is out. I'm dating our show. Sorry about that. But, of course, Golden State goes on to sweep Portland, and Portland hasn't got a chance. I'm sure Charles Barkley will have some more you know, bold <laughs> predictions. <laughs> he was just flat out wrong. <laughs> well, you know, as, as you think about as you think about values, and, and you go back to that thing we were talking about, the house painter, who, who yeah. instead of becoming a country singer, is painting houses and, and thrilled, happy. Yeah, right. uh, if, if values are the things that light us up, and when we do this in, in company settings, a lot of times it's like, people identify their values and then the next thing they'll say very often and i can relate because i could take on the same state of mind too is yeah but Mm. and then they list a circumstance Mm. such and such a circumstance prevents me from actually being able to live that value out and so well let's let's challenge that i mean both ways yeah Um, i know what we would say about that but which I, is? Well, which is that your circumstances aren't controlling your life. But in many cases, they, they kind of make a strong case for that. Sure. And I know you've, you've said some very uh, respectful things, acknowledging the burdens that a lot of people have in their lives, where circumstances right. are very, very tough. Uh, the way a person is born, what side of the tracks they're on, etc., etc. And... There is that thriving principle there that we can be bigger than our environment. Well, and that's that's the that's the hope, right? That's what we're we're aspiring to. We're trying to do. We try to live this out ourselves with varying degrees of success because we're a work in progress as well. And that is that when we talk about, let's say, my val- my I have a value of of creativity, mm-hmm. for example, and I have to go to these meetings that are just to me, boring as I'll get out. Mm-hmm. And so I say, well, I resign myself to the fact, well, it's just going to be a boring meeting, rather than what can I bring to that meeting to stimulate creativity, if for no one else other than me. Well, yeah, and this question leads us into what we really mean when we talk about values, which relates to bringing our values. Right. Because it's one thing to have values and keep them to ourselves and complain about how the environment doesn't let us live our values, it's quite another to make the choice, you know what, I'm going to infuse my values into this meeting, into this relationship, into whatever I'm doing. Right. I I was speaking with a a young woman uh, the other day, a remarkable person, and she has this value that... You know, she really wants to be able to serve people because she loves people. Mm. Just She just has a love for the human race, you mm. know. Bless her, mm. <laughs> you know, because yeah. sometimes that's hard. Yeah. And so over and over again, as I talk to her over the times when, we, when we're speaking, she will share with me a story of how the circumstances were such that who she was dealing with was somebody that was treating her with such disrespect mm. that it would be easy for her to justify saying, well, not this person. Mm-hmm. Right, to make an exception for yeah. them. Yeah. And, and, but she, she said, I refuse to let somebody else decide mm-hmm. what's important to me. 
What a great attitude. So then what did she do? Well, then then she just continues to treat them with respect. And at a certain point, you know, she kind of will have a conversation. You know, she was sharing with me about this one boss. And she said to him, because he'd been just, you know, treating not only her but other people really poorly. She said, are you okay? Mm. And he said, what do you mean by that? Mm. She said, well, you've, you've really been quite harsh and unkind to a lot of us and my experience is that i'm usually that way when something's bothering me or i'm in pain (laughs) and i'm I'm, I'm concerned about you i really care about you and i just wanted to know are are you okay Uh and uh, what was his response to that well he was just totally shocked he she said he he stopped it Uh looked like for a moment he was going to cry Uh and then he brusquely said well, I'll take that under advisement. I left the room. Huh? She said, but she's been watching how he's been showing up, yeah. and she can see him catch himself when he's mm-hmm. going to be harsh with somebody. But, you know, I mean, the, the huh? change in behavior is one thing, but the question is, what did that convey to him? Well, it's such great communication, and just to take apart your story there for a moment, she didn't condemn him. She didn't right. accuse him. She... Um, presented it as a question that was posed out of concern for him, so she was caring, and then she linked it back to herself. Right. I mean, those are all amazing communication points. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the people refer to that as uh, as emotional intelligence. We've started referring to it as thriving intelligence. Yeah, TQ. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, your thriving quotient. You know, so that, but that that is the the whole thing is is that she had this value. In other words, and she would say this: it lights her up mm-hmm. to be able to love on people, mm-hmm. to be able to reflect back to people their worth and their mm-hmm. value. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's that's what she does. Now, I know uh, another guy that I worked with. He was a manager. Um, it lit him up to tear people down. That was what he. Yeah, he, he, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, you go back to that and say, well. All right. Uh-huh. So that's a value that right now you're espousing. <laughs> it lights you up to tear people down. <laughs> right. And where do you think that's going to lead? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, inevitably, this conversation gets us into the domain of values conflicts. Right. We're already talking about. And, you know, I've noticed there's really three ways things can go. You know, you can have a value conflict that can resolve so that there's now resonance and a shared value. So right in the workplace or wherever. Then there's the explosion where it goes the other way. That it's like, okay, I'm out of here. Right, we just can't work together because nobody's budging. But the third one, which is where she was playing, is in the the resolution, the trying to make it work. So it's not I'm out of here, and it's not kumbaya. It's we're seeing if we can make some kind of change together. And that's where some real communication skills are required. And this woman you're mentioning has got them. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, well, and 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 the the key, just from what you were saying, I think, which our our listeners can easily relate to, is caring. Yeah. She wasn't using some communication technique she learned in a workshop. She genuinely cared. That's her nature. People feel that, and it's my belief and my experience that the genuine expression of caring, with no strings attached can often get through the barbed wire. There's a lot of defensiveness. We all carry for various reasons, but caring seems to be some kind of slippery, fluid thing that can get through defenses. Well, that's a that's a great point. And as you're, as you're talking about that, for some reason a conversation came to mind of somebody I was coaching uh, last year. And one of the things they brought up was, is, you know, the company espouses the following values, and they listed them off. But my manager and the senior manager that manages them don't seem to be living those at all, mm-hmm. at least from their perspective, they weren't. And so, you know, what what am I to do? I came here right. because the company espoused these values. And so, <laughs> right. you know, the, the question was, well, what are your values, uh-huh. right? And can you begin to infuse those into everything else you're doing and then you'll have to make a decision Mm -hmm. if what's important to you if what's valuable Mm -hmm. to you is that conflict with what's going on at work Mm -hmm. regardless of what's on the wall as a stated value 
you just have to ask yourself the question, am I willing to continue to go through this? Mm -hmm. Now, the answer might be yes, because I need the job and I'm not in a situation sure. where I can walk away. Sure. But at least then, I, you know, to say what you were saying, we'd go back and say, well, how can I infuse my values to the degree I can? Well, yeah, and I mean, as you're saying this, I'm sure it's obvious that the person is empowered while they're doing that. So rather than waiting for a change in the circumstance, you know, which would be nice, they're already feeling empowered because they're taking charge of the circumstance. Right, right. And, and then, you know, if appropriate at some future time and they find another place where they can land, they can always make that decision rather than feeling trapped mm -hmm. in, a, in a circumstance where their values are, are thwarted, you know. Well, it's something I've done on occasion, which is a little devious, but I do it with a good intention. <laughs> Not you. <laughs> well, true convention here. Uh, and the phrase that, uh, you know, I use to describe it is assuming a virtue. Right, right. Which is quite a principle. So in other words, I'll be working with someone and they're exhibiting behaviors that are, say, in direct conflict with the values of the organization we're both in. Well, rather than kind of busting them for that and provoking a conflict, because nobody really likes that when you call them out, you know, thank right. you very much for exposing how wrong I am. <laughs> That'll build friendship in a hurry. <laughs> so rather than doing that, I've really had fun with going the high road, saying, well, you know, here we are, and uh, you know, we're supposed to be doing this, and man, I, I don't think either one of us is, is doing a great job of it, but I'm trying, and you're trying, and you know, Forging an agreement, assuming that, that they're as interested as I am in living up to something, even though it seems like they're not. <laughs> right? well, well, and I think I, th I think sometimes I, I I can think of if I was in that situation, it might be that I'd be realizing, oh wow, I'm not. Yeah, well, that's what's happened sometimes. But yeah. I come across kind of as an innocent, you know. And I, right. and actually, my intention is is clear. I, I want to have more friendship while we're working. I want to have this conflict in the workplace between us, but coming at it from that level, right? You know, it's kind of like if you give a person a chance to shine, they often will. Whereas if you tell them they're not shining and they should, that's not nearly as inspiring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like you said, not often well received, no. right? Well, uh, yeah, part of part of one of the things we we recommend and, and try to do ourselves is to to make a list, just a short list, even of five or six. You could say characteristics or or ways of being that bring us real joy and and you know have us be at our best. Well, uh, give, give us a few of yours, just so well, we can grab yeah. Them. So so one thing that I I love people. Mm -hmm. So I I love to be working with people. That mm -hmm. to me just brings me a real lot of joy. And when I get the opportunity to be engaged on it, what I'm looking for is accomplishing the task, yes, mm -hmm. but really trying to enjoy the people I'm with and seeing if I can find the best in them. Yeah, well, what a, what a great value. Uh, one of mine is uh, spontaneity. Mm. I love spontaneity. So in my relationships with people, I love to feel safe to be spontaneous, and uh, I like that. You know, yeah. there's often times when I'll, you know, voice something that actually turns out to be fairly ridiculous. But you know, I'm fortunate to have friends who seem to value my <laughs> value of spontaneity enough to put up with this crazy idea, and we just all raise our eyebrows and move on. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than, in some way, you know. But that scolds you for coming up yeah. with a wild, crazy I, idea. I rarely have that. And often I'll give a little preamble. I'll say, well, you know, this might be a stupid idea, but, and that can help. But I just love exploration. That's a real value for me. So what would be the most deadening thing in the world would be for me to find myself on any kind of assembly line Ooh. where I need to duplicate what's been done before all day long. I mean, just shoot me. <laughs> this is not going to be fun for me. I don't care what they pay me. I'm going to innovate. I'm going to move the widget to the left. <laughs> I'm going to do number six before number four, right? I'm not the person you want on the assembly line. And that's a genuine value for me. You know, it's, it's, as you're saying that, I mean, I've worked with a variety of companies who make things, you know, from mm -hmm. washing machines to cars. And, and, uh, what's, what's really wonderful is when you're on an assembly line, and you see somebody who loves the precision and the consistency mm -hmm. and yeah. the, and for them, 
being able to do that the same way each time and yeah. have that consistency, right. it lights them up. So yeah. they should yeah. be there, right? They're, that's, they're in that's, a round peg in a round hole. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's the other thing about values is respecting each other's different values. Right. Because we don't all need to have the same ones. And, in fact, we don't have the same ones. Finding kind of the parts that we play in the orchestra. You know, yes. you don't want the whole orchestra to be flutes. <laughs> you need some oboes and some percussion. And I think that's a big issue today. There's a real attack on diversity, and it's it's heartbreaking to see how these concepts of superiority have taken a hold in politics, in economics, throughout our culture, that this is better than that. He is better than her, whatever it is. Right. Well, and and I think you know, again, going back to what can what can we do is is first one is just identify what lights you up, right? right. And then look at your life and and say, am I am I bringing that into my life and all the different activities I do in okay, such so, a way so, so that, I, that I make it work? So let's look at this because you know, if if a person, let's say somebody listening to our, our program here, does this. And they go, okay, what lights me up? And they realize that a lot of their time is spent doing things that doesn't light them up. I mean, you've coached enough people. What do you say to them? Well, so part of it is realizing that the the activity doesn't have to obviously align with the value. Mm -hmm. I gave the example about a boring meeting. Uh, Another one would be um, I, you know, had one person and she loved being able to interact and share with her husband what it was that she was accomplishing. Mm -hmm. And she was constantly on the road. Mm -hmm. So the chances for them to interact, they had to really schedule accordingly. But what she started to do, because she'd become really sad and frustrated, and yet she did like her job, was that she and her husband started to make it a point Mm -hmm. to when they had their calls, Mm -hmm. you know, usually in the evening, was they would they created enough time, even if it was only ten minutes each, to share what did you love about today, yeah. and yeah. they would share that with each other. And what it did is, then when she was going throughout the day, she was thinking of how she was going to share this with her husband. Okay, so this is very important. This, this is really su- such good wisdom. The key word in what you just conveyed from the story was created. Yeah, they created something. Now that is the key, because if we feel we're powerless because of the circumstance and we do not take initiative to create, we're not going to be happy. Well, yeah, we're going to be we're going to be stuck feeling trapped in maybe a mundane situation that doesn't resonate with us. And so I mean, I'm still remembering this guy who got up at a writer's conference I was at in Maui many years ago, best selling author. And he stood up there on the stage in front of about 1,200 of us, and he said, well, when I wrote this, I was uh, delivering pizza, and uh, <laughs> the and I, I had another job. The only time I had to write was Tuesday night. So this novel was written on Tuesday nights for three years. <laughs> That's great. So we all sat there going, whoa, he did not accept the limitation of time. Anybody else, or most people, I think, would have said, oh, I don't have time to write a novel. But he said, I'm writing my novel on Tuesday nights. He created that window of time and wrote a best-selling novel. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. What a great story. Well, and I think that's, that's like you said, that's really at the heart of what we're talking about, is that if we find out, if we take the time to really ask ourselves, what lights me up, mm-hmm. and we and we you know create the time create the moments to do that or decide that we're going to take charge of infusing you know what's the value i want to infuse into my day to day Mm -hmm. you know if i know that there's five that are really important Mm -hmm. to me which one or ones can i bring into my day well let's back up a little bit because you know we use this mark twain quote in our online course that it's no problem giving, helping people get what they want. The problem is that most people don't know what they want. Right. And I think it's fair to say that that is true for a lot of people. So, you know, hearing what we're saying, a person might be a little dumbfounded and go, well, I know what I don't want. Right. But what do I want? I think there's a lot of layers of programming that can get in the way, piled on top of each other from childhood, from mentors, parents, peers, etc., that program us. So, 
it may not be just as easy as asking the question, what do I, what, what lights me up? Right. It might take a little bit of work to dig down to that. That's right? a great point. That is a great point. I was, I was talking with somebody recently and they're, they're in college and, uh, what they were saying was they had been told by their parents who were both educators that, uh, education is an important value to have. And, you know, being a good student was, was important. And they found themselves bound by that. They mm-hmm. almost felt like they were doing, you use the word duty or obligation yeah. Yeah. to be a good student. And as we were talking about it, I, I said, well, do you enjoy school or what do you enjoy about school? They, they were saying, well, I, I love to learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I do love to learn, but but uh, you know the whole thing of of grades and the pressure of being a good mm-hmm. student and all these things and it was like well wait a minute yeah. what if just for fun just for an experiment you decided this next week that you're going to focus on the joy of learning mm-hmm. that's 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 yeah. the whole thing you're there to yeah. do is yeah. just have fun learning and get yeah. and you know exhibit the curiosity that you naturally have and see how you feel after that week mm-hmm. my guess is you know that if you do that, at the very least, you're going to be having a better experience. But also, you're probably actually going to do better on the tests because you'll be approaching it from a standpoint of the joy of learning rather than the obligation of being a good student. What a difference! I mean, that's just creating a different frame, a different context, a different understanding, or as we would say, telling a different story. Right. Right. Yeah, well, I think of this often when uh, I hear some definitive comment. You know these experts on the radio or television are always kind of coming out with these these statements that are like, you know, God has thundered from on high, and here it is. <laughs> and on occasion, there'll be another person, you know, on the screen, in the room, in the studio, who'll say, well, that's certainly not true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in other words, they'll meet this certainty, which is really an imposition, in the cases I'm mentioning, with their own viewpoint, which is just you know, without being antagonistic, flatly denying the certainty of what's just been said. And the times when I've heard that, I've always gone, I love that. <laughs> because it's kind of like that, that phrase, as seen on TV, or <laughs> right, you know, if right. it's on the Internet, it must be true. We give away our own uh, authentic, authentic sovereignty. We give away our values to someone else if they speak loudly enough, and if they seem to have a lot of confidence. So this isn't just something ingrained from childhood. I think this is happening all the time, that we are either living what lights us up as our values or taking on the values imposed on us from moment to moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's I, I think it's an ongoing quest in yeah. question, right, is that... Is that uh, and I always thought it was interesting that quest and question were so closely related. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. English language is full of those things. Yeah. That, that the, the quest really might be, you know, what is it right now in my life that's bringing me joy? Yeah. What is it that has me feel most alive? In this moment. In this moment. And how, yeah. can, I, how can I exhibit or bring more of that to the occasion? That's, that's the opportunity. Uh, you know, so a lot of times I think we realize, wow, I'm living out values that I borrowed yeah. from someone else yeah. that are now obligations and duties yeah. rather than things that are bringing me joy. And when that's the case, like mm-hmm. you said, maybe there's some good soul searching. Mm-hmm. What is it right now at mm-hmm. this point in my life that really brings me joy? Well, I had an occasion to communicate with someone the other day who's um, involved in quite a fracas with some of my friends. And I thought, how can I help in this situation? So I sent a little message, and I just said, uh, I have a favor to ask of you. Do you think it'd be possible in this situation that you could help increase love? <laughs> and I got the sweetest response back. This person said, you know what? I, I get what you're saying. I'm going to do that. That's beautiful. I, I tapped into a value that she has, which I have, and, you know, in two lines in an email, we connected that way. It was really cool. I love that. Well, if you have stories about values, write us at thrivinginbusinessandlife at gmail.com. I'm Christopher Harding. And as always, I'm Will Wilkinson, <laughs> and we'll talk to you again next week. <laughs>